Okay, guys, so this morning you have to uh, send an email about your idea. Uh, everyone uh, sent uh, the, the concept. If you, have, uh, if you don't, you have um, half an hour to do that. So after the uh, showcase from Andrea Orioli, we can uh, start uh, having a, a check about the ideas. I want to thank you all for the participation. Also, yesterday, till midnight, there were, there were a lot of teams that were working hard, so very happy about that. Today, I introduce Andrea Orioli. He's a, a character artist. I will add senior character artist, but just as my opinion. <laughs> and uh, he's... Uh, um, very oriented for game production, so today he will showcase what uh, his uh, pipeline is and what kind of uh, magical stuff he is able to create. He will stay with the desk, so if you have any question or you need uh, some information, it's, he is with us for all the camp. So welcome, Andrea, and uh, have a good showcase. Let's hope so. All right. Good morning, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, so, as Giacomo said, my name is Andrea Orioli. I am a character artist from Italy, uh, right now living in Rome. And, um, sorry, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, I didn't start my career as a character artist. I uh, used to work with Giacomo and Gian Pietro in Milestone. That was like my first step into the gaming world. and. Um, in Milestone, we used to uh, develop racing games. So the stuff I did in, at the beginning of my life as a, a game artist was hard surface. So here you have a few examples. Like uh, I used to do this ship from Wipeout because I'm a big, big fan of that series. Then some weapons. I get closer. Okay some weapons and ultimately down here you have uh, some motorbikes uh, I actually made uh, in 3D Studio Max back then for the early uh, Xbox 360 games uh, we used to develop there. Um, from there I started, um, I moved and I went to work uh, uh, in Holland uh, at Streamline Studios and I did also there a bit of uh, art surface and mostly uh, environmental props and that was the point when I kind of decided that I was tired of doing environment and I wanted to move more on characters and therefore the rest of my portfolio is just <laughs> characters that I've done uh, and especially characters from the game Dota 2 that I don't know if you guys know it's a MOBA pretty popular from Vault Software um, and the cool thing about Dota 2 is that uh, they, they allow everyone to participate in their workshop. So uh, anyone with any really skill in uh, character design and character art uh, can just download their models and work on top of them uh, to create new skins for the game and then propose to them uh, the skins and if they like them, they're gonna sell them for you, pretty much. Uh, today, although I want to concentrate on uh, two other characters that I'm working on. Well, one is finished, the other one I'm working on right now. And th this one in particular, it's called Green, Green, Green Block King. And it's not a concept of mine, but I'll, I'll show you in a second, uh, uh, more or less all the passages that I've, I've done to reach this uh, end result here. Uh, and I did it for um, Ancient Civilization Challenge on Art Station. Uh, it was a popular challenge that happened like uh, two, three months ago, I think, or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't finish it in time, so uh, it didn't get in the final selection. But um, this other one, I don't know if we will have time to talk about this one, but it's a just personal project I'm doing. And I called it Berserker Militia, and there's a specific reason for that. And also, we'll talk about that later, but pretty much. There's a, there's a lot of design choices behind this one, so I would like to be able to talk about it. Um, okay, first, first thing, though, I want to show you what's, uh, 
the five steps of uh, character production for game. All right, so we we'll start step one is gonna be the design. And in this case for the Grim Blood King, uh, the design was not done entirely by me, but the original concept is by this a uh, great uh, concept artist from Russia named Tata Tatiana Vetrova. Um, and yeah, well pretty much like in, usually in a, in a AAA environment when you develop uh, games uh, for the AAA uh, industry, uh, you're always, if you're a character artist and you, you, you model, you're, you just do the modeling of the character and the texturing, there's usually like a concept artist that is gonna come to you with a concept that you will have to develop. So uh, usually the design part is not entirely yours. Uh, although when you do your personal project, um, then you're free to just create whatever you want. And so there's gonna be also uh, the design involved. Uh, I also want to point out that design doesn't mean that it has to be a 2D drawing uh, or an illustration you can actually do the design part entirely in ZBrush if you want, uh, as long as uh, you just put in ideas, you study the shapes, uh, the forms, and especially you want to uh, concentrate on the, what I call uh, visual storytelling. Uh, and visual storytelling is uh, pretty much, um, not to explain it precisely, but you want the character to tell a story as soon as you see it. Uh, so you're gonna have to, um, for example, in, the, in, in this example, like um, you can immediately tell that he's a king because he has a crown, and then he has this other crown uh, of thorns or something like that, that is a bit more esoterical, and so you kind of gonna imagine that this guy has also some sort of powers or something like that. Um, from the rest of his dress, you can kind of uh, take that is probably a rich guy, uh, probably aristocratic or something like that. Well, and in fact, he's a king. Um, uh, you can tell that there is like some embroidery detail on his main vest, uh, and he has a lot of gold around him. But at the same time, he also has bandages. And so you would imagine that it's probably a guy that goes into battle quite a lot. And um, Tatiana also put like a, a dagger in his hand and that's maybe the only uh, choice of design that I didn't completely agree with because like I feel it kind of clashed with the rest. So I kind of, at the end, I kind of went me with my own idea of the weapon he should have. But anyway, so this is the part of design. Then you have sculpt and that's gonna happen most likely in ZBrush or Mudbox. Those are the usually, usually the two choices with probably a much more, um, uh, there are many more users of ZBrush, I suppose, uh, in general. Um, in the sculpt phase, um, you're still designing, by the way. There's not like, uh, okay, I have this uh, illustration here and so, uh, now I'm just gonna sculpt it. There's still a lot of decision making that you're gonna have to think about. Uh, because, for example, like if you see in the design, um, the concept, original concept, like um, this guy has these two pieces of cloth, one red and one brown, that you don't really know what they are or what material they are really, uh, or yeah, like you don't know anything about them really. They're, they're just pieces of cloth and not really easily identifiable. So you're gonna have to decide what those are and um, how they're gonna be interesting on him. At the same time, you're also gonna uh, try to figure out uh, uh, what, yeah, all the materials that um, are in this design and try to sculpt um, all the details accordingly. So um, let's say, for example, I don't know, like the, the main uh, tunic or vest, I decided that it's, it was gonna be uh, imperial silk. Uh, I decided that mostly uh, at this stage, but also later with the textures. Um, so you're gonna have to you know, sculpt certain type of folds accordingly to how imperial silk would behave as a cloth. Um, okay, then 
we move on the probably most crucial part of uh, the character production for games, which is you take your sculpt and then you're gonna have to retopo it. Uh, and okay, you know, the sculpt has like 50 million polygons. This thing, it's not usable in a tree edge engine ever, pretty much. It's too heavy. Uh, it's not gonna be easy to animate at all. So there's no chance this would enter in the game. Therefore, we do another mesh that uh, pretty much follows completely the original sculpt. Uh, well, in this case, it's in a T pose, the sculpt. I put like his arms a little more lower just for the sake of presentation. Um, but so yeah, like uh, as you can see here, I, I show the wireframe uh, and the wireframe is really important because uh, it pretty much, oh, something is saving, okay. Um, it's really important um, because pretty much like um, it's gonna help uh, the whole scene animate, I mean like being, uh, the whole uh, character being uh, easy to animate. Uh, at the same time, it's gonna be way less heavy on a 3D engine that can move only a certain amount of polygon uh, each frame. And we know that in nowadays games, we gonna reach like 60 frames per second. So that means uh, the scene has to be recalculated every uh, 60 times a second. So it's kind of like, you know, you gotta keep things li as light as possible. And so like at the end, we have um, a final mesh that is like uh, 70,000 polygons. Uh, and you're gonna transfer uh, all the details from the sculpt uh, through a normal map on top of it through a bake process, which is still like one of the most uh, misunderstood, at least talking to people like many times people tell me their own rule of baking that I don't really understand. For me, there are very simple rules and uh, I don't know, sometimes uh, I feel like people think that baking is kind of like voodoo and it's a weird thing. <laughs> anyway, once you're done with baking, your job is almost over. That means that you only have, have left texture uh, to do. And again, also in this phase, you're gonna have to uh, think about uh, what this guy is wearing and design materials accordingly. So for example, with the silk, you're gonna have uh, to pretty much render the physical properties of, of silk. Uh, in this case, we're working with a 4K texture and uh, the important part is like, it's a PBR material. So uh, physically, physically based render, which means everything is gonna pretty much behave like in reality. Uh, or approximately uh, like so. Um, and in this particular case, I went with color, metal, and roughness uh, maps, which are pretty much the standards uh, in a character like this one. So in the end, again, we have presentation, which is really important just for really yourself and your portfolio. Uh, you're gonna post it on social networks, gonna get the glory, and then you're gonna start over. So <laughs> this is pretty much how you create a game for char uh, character for games. So now I'll go a bit more into depth. I'm gonna show you um, how this character came to life um, in ZBrush mainly because that's how I start uh, usually. And how I start is this, oh, that's out of scale. But so the easiest way to start a character usually is these spheres because they allow you to just create like a very rough anatomy of whatever you're gonna um, create later. And from here, you move into a basic anatomy, which is like a bit out of scale as well. Like I just noticed that his head is a bit too big compared to the body, but whatever. Like you're gonna have like your uh, base anatomy on which um, you're gonna create pretty much all the rest of the cloth uh, and the garments, so all these accessories pretty much. One thing to notice is that uh, you want to have this and then uh, usually it's a good idea to bring this into um, or through Studio Max or Maya, whatever software you use, and, and then uh, create your uh, base topology uh, there. This is especially useful 
when you already have a design. And so you are exactly know what you're gonna do. Um, I tend to um, go with a, a specific uh, topology and specific uh, um, created items into Tutorial Studio Max so that I can also use uh, UV texture, but only when I have already a design. So I'm not gonna mistake much of what the character is gonna look uh, at the end. Uh, instead, in other cases, when I do like my own design, then I am just going to create stuff in ZBrush uh, with um, Dynamesh and stuff like that. But I'll show you that later, maybe with the Orc. Um, all right, so um, things to note here. Um, all the meshes are really low poly, and they are pretty much just the, um, the main elements of the whole design, okay? so. Um, for the rest of the elements, I'm probably going to create them in ZBrush because it's actually some time easier. Oops. Uh, another important thing is uh, to UV, um, so create like a UV coordinates for uh, the items you bring inside ZBrush, uh, and that's mainly because uh, uh, many times it's really good to use um, where is it? Like the noise maker. The noise maker. It's that tool that at the end, when you're done with pretty much all your uh, big shapes, um, it's gonna help you like bring in like uh, a higher level of detail that otherwise it's hard to uh, obtain in different ways. Um, all right, so yeah, as you can see, like here, I also created the horns. These are created inside ZBrush instead, and not inside Tree Studio Max. Uh, and I, I use these spheres for those and also for the branches he has um, around this belt. Now, next step, we have more branches that are still like placeholder, same for the horns. Uh, but you can see, like, I start creating the base shapes of every <coughs> garment that is involved, especially the hood, the cape, and a bit the main vest. Um, at this stage, I still haven't thought what I'm gonna do with, uh, if we go back to uh, this concept. Again, there is like this red uh, garment and the brown one, they are here, but I still don't know where I'm going with those. I sculpted a few folds and I'm still deciding uh, what would make them interesting. All right. Um, it's also important to notice that in ZBrush, um, the, usually the, main, uh, the best way to go about your models is you wanna go, you, you wanna start like putting in the big shapes always at the beginning. It's always from, deep, from big shapes to detail and never the other way around. Uh, that's real, really important because um, you can go into as much detail as you want, but if your big shapes don't work like from this distance, let's say, then the model is going to look weird and it's not going to look right, all right? Um, you also want to make sure that, um, okay, again, studying a bit how garments work. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a little more folds where the garment is going to pinch and it's going to group together, so around this neck in this case. And then instead, you're going to use less folds and bigger folds uh, once it's more free, uh, free to flow, you know. Same also here in the front, like uh, we have, we're starting to have a little more um, folds here where uh, the vest is like uh, attached together and a bit less down here at the bottom where it's just straight uh, down to the ground. Um, yeah, here I started to define a little bit this one. Um, still not sure exactly where I'm going, but I had this idea of making it like uh, these um, strips of leather uh, that are stitched together. And you'll see that better in the next uh, step. Well, no, actually, I left it like that, but <laughs> never mind. Um, well, you see it better at the end then, I guess. Um, in this step, I started uh, detailing a little bit more everything. So again, starting with the garment, uh, I started adding stitches. Uh, so this is also an important thing, like you're always gonna uh, start, you're always gonna imagine uh, how a certain 
um, piece of cloth is stitched together because it's never just one piece of cloth in that shape. It's usually like, I don't know, uh, a square or uh, a rectangle that then is being stitched like through a side and that stitch is probably gonna be visible somewhere. So you gotta think of where that would be. Same for the cape, but the cape, uh, I did a different treatment here and which is I started modeling a bit of secondary fold and memory folds. And memory folds usually help to convey the idea of um, a cloth that gets folded, like, I don't know, to put away somewhere, you know? And this is also part of the storytelling. I mean, you wanna always create materials that make you imagine what happened to that material to look like that. So uh, in this situation, I tried to make some main folding lines. So this one and this one, just imagining that someone would fold the cape uh, usually in those points. Uh, and a few like vertical, just because maybe uh, the cape hasn't been put away uh, like very well or something like that. So like uh, uh, it has like some extra uh, memory folds that you wouldn't want to see maybe. Um, same for the front, I guess. No, I didn't do memory folds much here yet. But one thing I did is um, make the material uh, interact with each other. So for example, in this case, he has like this branch fr from concept, he has this branch coming out of his belt. And so one thing that you're gonna do, you're gonna have to do is make it interact with the bottom vest. And so the vest is gonna be squished uh, towards the chest uh, in this specific area. And there's probably gonna be also some uh, folds and pinches that are gonna happen in this area. Because like the vest is constricted to the chest. Um, I don't notice much more to say about this. Oh yeah, I guess we can talk about these trims that um, I decided to um, go back in Max and create these trims with a nice um, UV so that I could actually apply this alpha that I did uh, separately still in ZBrush. <coughs> and so you, I can have like this uh, nice decoration trim that it's also here, as you can see, all around the cape and all around the hood. Also started to sculpt a bit the wood of the horns, uh, but just very lightly, very basic shapes of wood, just to give that idea. And again, this works best when you see it at a mid distance, while it's not gonna work that well when you see it uh, this close. And when you see it this close, you're gonna do some micro detail that is gonna pop up in the last file. Uh, Oh yeah, one thing to notice also, I made his face a little more young, like it's in the concept, like before instead was like, I don't know, a little more older, like even more evil, like look like a Sith, Sith Lord or something like that for some reason. Um, all right, let's go to the very last file. And this is the final sculpt, so there's no more in iterations after this one. As you can see, like, in the very last file, I kind of defined everything um, as the material that it should be in my imagination. So um, design choices here. I finally finished like uh, the two um, pieces of garment that he has around his belt. Um, and in this specific case, uh, I went with leather in this one and it's all stitched together. And with the bottom one, I uh, had the idea to go with something that I usually consider quite uh, aristocratic. I don't know, I usually see it in some, uh, I don't know, aristocratic garment, yeah, like mm, garment for rich people. And it's uh, quilted. I love quilted stuff for some reason, I don't know why. So I just went with a quilted uh, cloth that probably would be silk at the end. I don't really remember what I decided for this one in uh, material phase. But another thing, it's always important to, again, define the base shape of the quilt, uh, the quilted garment, uh, and then go in with like a smaller brush and start making like this uh, small um, little mm, shapes in which like uh, the garment is not just 
uh, flat and still, but you're gonna give it a bit more of flow, a bit more of uh, gravity affecting it, you're right? Um, it's, it's gonna be a bit loose in certain areas, and so you gotta show that. At uh, the same time, I, as I said before, I use like noise maker uh, to make, uh, okay, uh, to make these micro details. And then I went into some references for um, Imperial Silk. And, and it's really cool when uh, they show how Imperial Silk actually, when it gets damaged some time, it creates these little ridges uh, over the the, um, uh, the material that also give it like pretty much the, the look that it usually has. Um, it's usually like um, an imperial silk that has been through some weathering, and so it's never gonna look like um, uh, super precise and like shiny. But it's always gonna have a little bit of uh, wear and tear on top of it, and like these little ridges also show that. Um, same for the, the back here, the, the cape, uh, same as before, we have like uh, all our memory folds and I added a little more of damages and hole, uh, some little wear and tear, they usually kind of sell well uh, the property of the material. Uh, as well here, horns, uh, on top of the uh, previous, um, let's say, passage of um, uh, wood modeling uh, that would look good from a mid-range. Now I went into uh, much more detail using like uh, some three bark alphas and stuff like that and tried to bring in like a bit more of the look of a, a bit thick branch or something like that. Uh, a few pores for the skin, but uh, that's really like uh, pretty much all micro deta detailing. Um, I want to spend a couple of words for the uh, uh, embroidery that was really, really hard to pull off, honestly. It's like, uh, in this case specifically, I went in um, on the main uh, vest and I, I created a, a mask uh, through uh, an image I found in the internet of a tree and I put it into alpha pretty much and I created like this uh, silhouette and then I extruded it to a new subtool and uh, went on top of it with a little brush that pretty much simulate like um, pretty much little um, fibers that go on, on top of each other uh, just to do a little bit of uh, this effect, this little noise that uh, you can see here. Um, well, I don't think there's much more to say about the sculpt here, I guess. I mean, all the rest is pretty much the same uh, the same way, uh, the same uh, process, like uh, uh, always sculpt early, the big shapes, then some middle uh, details, middle shapes again, and then go micro with uh, some alphas or uh, property of the material that you want to try to achieve. So in this case, it's mostly fabrics and stuff. All right, from here, uh, we're gonna bring this, uh, right now I don't have 3D Studio Max, but uh, the process would be we'd bring this uh, into 3D Studio Max and we're gonna start to retopo uh, in order to obtain this model here, all right? We were talking about retopo and bake, so. When we go to retopo and bake, the final result is gonna be this. And this is the low poly model. So as you can see, it doesn't have any of the detail I just showed you like uh, a second ago. And it's mostly like uh, clean geometry. Uh, all the back is just, it just follows pretty much the main shapes. Uh, so you can see like these folds I did at the beginning in the model, they're still showing up because those are gonna probably be visible even in the original, uh, I mean in the game model. Uh, as same as the shapes on top of the cape. Uh, as you, if you want to see the low, uh, the wireframe, there you go. Um, everything is pretty much uh, created uh, in quads in certain areas. I use triangles, but it's usually not a big deal. Uh, 
uh, yeah, and on this model, well, you gotta you gotta pay attention mostly to a few factors. Like, uh, um, you're gonna have to have enough geometry, especially especially in the joints, uh, because the joints are those that are gonna be movable in in, in the in the final mesh when, when someone is gonna rig it, put bones, and animate it. Uh, so you, go, you wanna make sure that the joints have enough geometry, so especially around elbows usually, and now you cannot see it here. Uh, right, here around the elbow, I did a few extra lo loops, just in case. Um, the hands, uh, well in general, like I try to keep, in general, usually like um, um, more or less the same resolution, polygonal resolution all over the, throughout the whole model, uh, except the face, because usually the face uh, is much more important. Someone is gonna, I mean, some games, many games actually do zoom in on the face, so you always wanna have more polygons there uh, in order also to allow uh, fashion animations, and then also the use of blend shapes uh, to make like specific, um, specific like emotion pop up in the face of the character. And the face, the face topology always has to be like fairly standard, meaning that uh, there's always like some main loops that you have to respect. So there's always like this one going around the mouth and then the one going around the eye. And you're always gonna do them like that because uh, pretty much like those are the areas that moves the most on a face. So. Uh, you want to be sure that uh, they're going to move right and they're not going to create some artifacts because the topology in that situation is not good enough. <laughs> All right, so at this point you have this and you're going to have to <coughs> bake normal maps. And I can only show you the final result uh, of when that happened. And the final result is here, but without wireframe. Okay, so. This is our final uh, low poly model, but with baked in normal maps. Uh, and as you can see, like all the details remain, they're all here, the embroidery, uh, the little fabric uh, details, uh, pretty much everything remains. Uh, again, you can see it with wireframe on. And you can see that many of this like uh, detail that I did like uh, in, in ZBrush, you don't even have to uh, do geometry for them because uh, the normal map is gonna help you pretty much show this stuff uh, as better, uh, I mean, as good as it was in ZBrush. Um, you wanna use Polygon mostly uh, to <coughs> make silhouettes uh, as round as possible. So for example, like you're gonna have to you, maybe I should have used more geometry in this case, maybe, uh, for uh, the, this curve on the, on the hood. And that's mainly because like, these are gonna be the thing that give away the fact that this is a game model. If you do your job right, um, and you see this model, let's say from a respectable distance, let's say this distance, you shouldn't be able to tell if this is an iPoly model or a game model, okay? That's the whole point of doing normal maps. You want this to look as detailed and realistic as possible. Possibly, mm, like, uh, trick, I mean, like, uh, trick the eye of the watcher and into thinking that this is an iPoly model. All right, um, last thing on the process was texturing. And this is done mainly in Substance Painter. Um, in this situation, I, this was like my first time using Substance Painter, really. Uh, so I kind of organized this whole scene in which I uh, exploded all the parts of the model into different positions so they're easy to uh, texture separately. I didn't know yet that there was the texture list, so that's a, a little mistake on my side. Um, and yeah, pretty much like uh, my organization, it's probably <coughs> not perfect, but I'm gonna show you pretty much uh, uh, through what process I go usually. Uh, I usually pretty much a very standard Photoshop approach, meaning that I start with a base 
uh, color based material and then start building on top of that with like uh, color variations and some detailing given by um, the uh, cavity map or curvature map. Uh, and then in the end, like uh, add some more damages and dirt and everything that would affect the physical property of the material uh, in order to also in this case, like tell a story. For, so for example, like let's go on the Cape, which is usually my favorite. Um, all right, so this is the final result of the texture I made, uh, but let's, Let's see it in step by step. So I'm going to turn all this layer off. And this, OK. This is the white model. It's just normal map and nothing more, OK? Just the white material, like basic material in ZBrush, same thing. Now we start with a base layer. And this is going to be a sort of green that you can probably pick from directly from the image of the concept, so you're not going to go too far from it. A uh, few things to notice, like I decided to go, as I, again, like I said, I was going to go for Imperial Silk, so uh, Silk as, oh, where's, uh, wait a second, sorry. Well, half of my <laughs> interface is going in another place for some reason. Okay, never mind. So uh, silk has a um, metallic property. Uh, it's not made of metal, but uh, technically it's, uh, it has this uh, reflection that really mimic like material, uh, metallic surfaces. Uh, so in this case, you cannot see them here because it's out of the screen, but um, I pop up the metallic property of this material up to 0.9, I think. And I'm gonna give it like a, a medium roughness. Uh, if I go too rough, then you're not going to see anymore uh, the property of the material. If I go too low, it's going to look like a chromatic, I don't know, something weird, really. So I think like this mid-range is a 0.5, uh, works pretty well with it. Uh, then on top of it, roughness variation. And this is a layer I like to use many times just to give like a little break uh, in, the, um, in the specular in like what the reflection of the metalness causes because like if you don't use this, it's all way too uniform. So this is gonna break it up like a little bit just to add a little variation to the material. Then on top of these, I go with color variations uh, and in this specific case, I used like a grunge map and uh, painted it away some, somewhere. Uh, so these add a little yellow uh, decoloration all over the place. And I really didn't care much about where they go in uh, because in general, I wanted to keep it a little more messy. Uh, it was like a bit too uh, uniform before at the beginning. Uh, so, again, another color variation, this one is a little more towards blue, and they're still all green, but, you know, this one a little more towards yellow, this one a little more towards uh, marine green, blue green. Um, and again, this is going to add uh, some more variations, so um, I'm pretty happy at this point with the look of the base material, okay? It still looked too clean, but at least the the color variation add enough so that this, uh, this material could kind of work a little bit, uh, but not yet, because we're gonna enhance a little bit the details uh, using, in this case, the cavity map. Cavity map, is a, it's a map that uh, you're, gonna, uh, you're gonna bake. Like in the, in, the fa in the bake phase, you're gonna always create normal maps, uh, curvature map or cavity map. Um, uh, than whatever it is, like position map uh, and uh, object normal maps that are normal maps based on the word space rather than on the tangent space. It's a bit technical, that one. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I, I add like this uh, cavity here and fix it with some levels just, just to create, um, make the micro details pop up a little more. As you can see, like you can see the the, the garment fiber a little better. Um, 
then again, light damages. This one, it took me a while, and as you can see, like it has uh, several layers on top. So it's still based on the cavity uh, curvature. I always call it cavity for some reason. Um, and this actually, I, I had like a thought process. I, you know, you got, you're gonna think like, okay, where's this cave gonna get damaged the most? Uh, and usually it's in the most exposed parts. Uh, so in this situation, I would say it happens mostly in these folds that are like always more exposed than the rest of the cave, uh, the shoulders in general. Uh, and then I did like a little bit here and there just because whatever can, I mean, something has happened to uh, this cave. It doesn't always happen, of course, in the most exposed part. So you're gonna have some more decolorations like uh, in areas like this. Oh, this brush is huge, okay. Uh, in areas like this, or like pretty much also the flat areas are not immune to uh, da light damages, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, th that's mostly the, pr the thought process that uh, I use when I try to wear and tear. Oh, that, that is what was saving, okay. Um, yeah, you always wanna use like this uh, sort of wear and tear on your materials to make them believable, make them uh, look like they have been through stuff. They tell a story. So it's not just uh, out of uh, the factory 10 minutes ago, but this guy has certainly done something with it, went to battle or something like that. Um, the last layer, it's a dirt layer, and you don't see it much because it's mostly at the bottom. And again, uh, this, it sort of simulates some sort of mud that has stained this, uh, uh, this cave. And again, the mud usually comes from the bottom, so you're gonna have to uh, do your, this like mask uh, in which you specify that uh, with the, uh, where is it? Um, position mask. Mm. Word position gradient. Okay, so with a position gradient, you're gonna determine where this mask is gonna affect the cape. And in this case, specifically at the bottom. Uh, and then you're gonna add on top like uh, some grunge mask and grunge mapping so that it doesn't look just a uniform gradient, but it's gonna have like some splotches and stuff like that. Uh, and then in the end, like a little sharpen, just to make everything look a little more detailed, although it's like a chip trick. Uh, all right, uh, I can show you also the leather uh, very quickly. Uh, also in this case, uh, same, same kind of approach. So let's open it, let's turn off all the layers. Okay, and go back to white. There's like a little big error here that I didn't notice, so it's there, look at it. <laughs> I failed. Uh, so base material. Uh, in this situation, it's actually sometimes really helpful to start with one of the base materials of substance because you can have all your uh, little pre-made materials down here, they're gonna take no, not even too long to load, okay. So you have leathers here. You have three, four type of leathers. So leather bag, uh, big grain, medium grain, and soft grain. I went with medium grain in this one, and by using this one, you pretty much get for free like uh, uh, this uh, bumpiness of the leather that actually sell the effect pretty well in this area, especially here in the back as well. Now uh, here's more visible, so let's look at the back. Um, then we go on top of it with, again, some uh, uh, roughness uh, breaks. So it's just uh, some variation that I add to the roughness all the time just to not make it look like so uh, flat, so just uniform. Uh, like every material, as soon as you, uh, I don't know, like a shiny table, as soon as you touch it one second, it's gonna change completely the roughness in that point. It's gonna become more like uh, oily and stuff like that. So that happens to material all the time. Um, then uh, color variation. So we're gonna go with some brighter colors, like especially 
uh, especially like leather when it gets like uh, a bit more worn and you're gonna start to see like the brighter color that are at the bottom. And so in this case, uh, I started putting some more uh, of this wear and tear, uh, usually along the edges, uh, because again, they are the most exposed parts. Uh, and here at the bottom as well, it usually works pretty well with like edges. You just go through uh, the contour or of the whole item and the most exposed part, and it's hard to to go wrong in that situation. Um, then again, cavity decoloration. So in this case, again, it's wear and tear, but in this specific case, is for uh, the areas where uh, this specific material is gonna bend the most. <coughs> and where it's gonna bend the most, uh, it's gonna uh, wear more. So uh, also there, uh, using a lighter color for that area. Then in the end, some more scratches. So again, very used. Um, uh, material, uh, it has uh, some damages. By the way, you're seeing the, the texture in 2K. Uh, at the end, it should be even more detailed than this, but uh, to work usually in Substance Painter, it's easier if you use 2K, otherwise it's gonna explode. Um, so again, yeah, uh, in this case, we did like some heavier damages, and in this case, we also use a bit of um, height. Uh, and you can see, like, this is going to create a little more the idea that uh, some damage there happened and it went more in depth. Uh, and again, the, the, the color is going to be lighter even there. So uh, this sells the idea that it has been uh, scratched away or something like that. And then in the end, uh, well, then in the end, just color variations. Like, uh, I thought it was a bit too dark. Uh, then in the end, I thought it was a bit too light. <laughs> so in the end, I just went with this uh, tone of leather. I like usually like uh, dark, desaturated colors. It's like uh, I don't know a fetish I have for some reason. Um, all right, yeah, I guess that's it really for the textures. I, I don't know how much time have we left. Yeah, I think we are. We're done. Yeah. Okay. Well, well then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks to Andrea for this incredible presentation. Now you understand why I consider Andrea a senior character artist. And uh, with Billy presentation yesterday, with Gian Pietro presentation, and today with uh, Andrea's presentation, the idea is to show how you can create word and process for a game with Billy, how to uh, consider fundamentals with uh, Gian Pietro advices, and how go into the production from concept to real asset with Andrea. So for us, these are the value, the technical value for the tech lecture that you have. So thanks, Andrea. And now we will move back to the lab. And yeah. What? Final thing that I totally forgot to show that. Uh, so just wanted to like load the final scene in the end, just to show it to you how it looks in the end. I mean, like, that, that was not it. That, I mean, like, uh, that, there's the final part, you know, like, so. <laughs> this is how it's gonna look in the end, like, um, pretty much. You, you're gonna do, like, uh, sorry, I forgot about that for some reason. Um, you're gonna do, like, a presentation in which you show pretty much all your side of your model, and I told you at the beginning, sorry, there was like a design choice that I didn't like about the original concept that was like, uh, he's using a dagger, uh, and I really wanted him to be a magical guy. So he uses magical powers, and so I give him this orb with firepower and stuff like that. But that's it, oh, now I'm really done. <laughs> I like your, I don't know why, I really appreciate. So now we uh, have to go back at work, we uh, need to close the submission one, so your ideas, and we will have a moment to present the desk mentors because yesterday was a full of presentation, so probably we arranged the team just to present who will be the person that will collaborate with you. 
and um, and that's all. That's all. Thanks, guys, and good work.